Okay, so today we're kicking off with Revelation 17. And this is the fall of the religious Babylon. The con concept of Babylon, Revelation 16, 19, and 14, 8, have already declared Babylon's fall. In Revelation 17 and 18, the fall of Babylon is carefully detailed. It is. Let's get ready to say, I'm glad you said that about 18. Babylon is mentioned 287 times in Scripture, more than any other city except Jerusalem. Babylon was a literal city on the Euphrates River. Genesis 11, 1 through 10 shows us that right after the flood, Babylon was the seat of the civilization that expressed organized hostility to God. Babylon was later the capital of the empire that cruelly conquered Judah. Babylon to them, the Jews, was the essence of all evil, the embodiment of cruelty, the foes of God's people, and the lasting type of sin, carnality, lust, and greed. Well, let me tell you this, okay? We're learning this morning. And we've been preparing for these two chapters right here. Now, if you go back to Daniel, Daniel, where, remember, they, the Israelites were taken captive, and they were taken to Babylon. Who was the king? Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, right. And Nebuchadnezzar was the king that had the writing on the wall. Daniel interpreted it. Now, this morning, you're going to hear about countries and that, that statue, and it talks about kingdoms and kings in here today. Mm -hmm. You're going to need to go back to Daniel and read about that statue. Okay, what each one means in its different countries. And what's amazing, I wish I could have pointed it out. You'll see Persia, you'll see uh, Persia, which is Iran. Mm -hmm. Persia okay. was Pakistan, yeah. Iran. Right, right, see. And some other nation. Yeah, there's one more. Yeah. But when you see that, these, and it talks about six have fallen, mm -hmm. well, it IDs these nations that we're hearing from today. Okay? Right. The seventh nation is the nation yet to come. And that's the one that's in Revelation. <coughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's important that we bring Daniel into this because Daniel already predicted all of this. Exactly. Okay? So when we're studying and you're hearing about this and this and this, well, Daniel is a big player in all this. Right. Because it IDs all the kingdoms. So if you've got a question about who those seven kings were or kingdoms, go back to Daniel, read that part, and you'll see what, like you said, Iran, uh, uh, maybe Iraq, Turkey, uh, Turkey, Yemen, all of that. You'll see the different ones that have fallen already, biblically. Right. They're gone. Right. And what, 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 what that brings to light is the Bible is so true. Mm -hmm. Because it, I did these six countries already right. in that statue. Exactly. Okay? So that's what brings the, well, the word of life right there. Exactly. Yeah. If you take this country, say we're one <coughs> at one time, and if you divide them up, they're numerous. Right. They're there numerous, is. and, and, and you've got to add Russia, too. Well, you've got these different kings now. Yeah. 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 And what well, we call about Armageddon. No. Well, yeah. But well, see, even back when Daniel was there, yeah. you think about the kingdoms there, and we now we have modern day names for those kingdoms. Right. What you got to do is find out who those kingdoms are today. Right. That's what. That's the point I'm making. And for that, we can add that to our study, especially for 18. Yeah. Now that Babylon's fallen, 18 yeah. says Babylon tells you what happens after Babylon falls. See, here's what puzzles me a little bit: is everyone is supposed to come from the east, right? But. And that's the reason the Euphrates dried up. That's right. So the armies could get across over that, that, that's exactly Jerusalem. Right. Right. But they're not all coming from the east. Well, some of them are. Well, when the Bible says these, is it a compass point? Yeah. Or is it a, a description of where you see yeah. these countries? So it makes me wonder, every one of these countries except one, and that's an atheist country, <coughs> or Muslim, every one of sure, them. Sure, I agree with you. Super, super rich mm -hmm. with the oil fields. Yeah. Every one of them are rich. Yeah. Is this where the commercialization is going to be? Is this going to be the center 
Is this going to be uh, the people controlling no, where the money flows? No, because, no, here's why. They have a one-way play. Right? They're channeled in their effort, the hate of everybody. Uh, Babylon is a system, and that Babylon is Rome. Rome is going to re reenter. I can't buy that yet. Rome, Rome is going to reenter. Well, that, that's what they Since bless them about. Yeah, crazy. we're actually going to get into that. <laughs> Look, the Bible, that's what we're going to learn today. Yeah, that no, Rome but is. There's something that's really amiss there. Mm -hmm. It's wrong. Because it's European countries. Mm -hmm. No, but you got to remember, Rome, Rome, when it says Rome, is it a physical location or is it a a descriptive location. Yeah, but it's still, you still have to have those European countries. In I agree with you. I agree. So and uh, no, but think about this. Go back, go back to Jesus' time. Now, who was in control while Jesus was on earth? Well, of course, Rome. Rome was. Well, the Romans, right? Rome. How did the Europeans control the Middle East? The only thing that I can see is Rome's on seven hills. That's the only logic that I see that's evolved in that. To me, the enemy of Christianity, you talk about false prophets, you talk about talk about money, wealth. It's got to be the Muslim nations. Well let's say it yet, we'll say. If they're not if they're not the number one, they've got to be part of it. They're gonna be part of it. I think that yeah, they'll be part of it. They won't. They're not number one. They're they're not going to lead this because the Bible won't lend itself to that. If you study that statue I just told you about, look at the nations' names on that statue. And what are they? Well, Persia. Yeah. Look at what is. Yeah. Well, what you're saying when when you say Middle East, you're thinking more of uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Lebanon, and places like that, and they're going to be in control. They're not in control. You've got to find. You got to. You, we, go ahead, Tammy, because we're talking all about your lesson. Yeah, we're well, okay. keep, keeping her. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, no, that's fine. I so agree. to those familiar with the Old Testament, the name Babylon is associated with organized idolatry, <coughs> blasphemy, and the persecution of God's people. In John's day, Rome epitomized all the antagonism and opposition to the Christian faith. In some ways, the city of Rome was the clearest fulfillment of the Babylon attitude. If we had to pick one city today that most exemplifies this the world system, perhaps we would say Los Angeles is Babylon. The concept of Babylon is greater than Revelation 17 and 18 and the Antichrist reign. Babylon was present in John's day. In our day and throughout history as the world system but under the Antichrist Babylon is in both its religious and commercial aspects will have influence over the earth as never before so we look at the great harlot in verses 1 and 2 then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me come I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with the whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Her judgment is assured at the outset. There is never any doubt regarding the fate and ultimate failure of Babylon. As a religious system, Babylon came into being long before Christianity, but in satanic imitation, it anticipated the coming true Messiah. According to religious history and legend, the Babylonian religion was founded by the wife of Nimrod, a great-grandson of Noah. Who's that, Jezebel? She was Nimrod's wife? No, Jezebel was... Uh, Semiramis? No. Semiramis? Tamu Tammuz. Tammuz was... That was her son. 
She was a high priestess of idol worship, and she gave birth to a son she claimed was convinced miraculous, conceived miraculously. The wife of Ahab. The son named Tammuz was considered a savior. Many ancient artifacts remain with this familiar motif of the mother Semiramis holding the savior infant Tammuz, which predate Christianity. It was also said that Tammuz was killed by a wild beast, then miraculously brought back to life. Baal was the local Canaanite named for the Babylonian Tammuz. The Bible makes specific mention of some of these features of classic religion of Babylon. Ezekiel protests against the ceremony of we weeping for Tammuz. Jeremiah mentions the heathen practice of making cakes for the Queen of Heaven and offering incense to the Queen of Heaven. Who sits on many waters? Here Babylon sits on many waters. That is, she presides over many nations. She has a universal international character. This is unification of all false ideologous religion with representatives from the apostate Catholicism, Protest Protestantism, <coughs> as, as well as a smorgasbord of other religions around the Catholics world. Catholics and Protestants. <coughs> The woman pictures false religion that will dominate the world in the tribulation period. I was period. waiting for you to say that because that's what it says to break forward first to all religions of the world that ever have been. Right. But, you know, I'm dense this morning or something, but Babylon is not a city. Babylon is not a woman. Babylon is a system. And what right. it is... Of all religions. Of all, uh, religions economics, right, and politics, I said that. all of that, that is Babylon. And Babylon being a system, and when it says that they call her great horror because all the nations have come and served her and gave her money, gave her all this right. power because they're weak-minded and silly-nilly-nilly Christians or believers that wouldn't stand up for the truth. And that's what happened. And the fornication is what? When they commit fornication with her, that is spiritual idolatry. Right. That's what it is. Okay. So we need to call it what it is. Babylon is a system. When when we start painting it as a nation that is that you can touch and feel. No, and lose, that's not what I was ourselves. saying. And that's not what I was saying because I, I, I had mentioned that it was the economic power and it was the different things. Well, we got okay, like verse two, whom the kings of the earth. I haven't got to that point yet. Well, I thought you were in two. Well, let me ask you this. I am, but I haven't started discussing uh, okay. that yet. All right. Well, all that, other, all, all that other jazz you were doing, I was like, is there a central location for this system? Rome. 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 That's where you think it's in, it's in, the, it's in the Bible. That, that's where I get it, is at Rome. Well, it's, uh, it, 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 Rome. It's, gonna, it, it's, it's in here. It's in chapter 17 and 18. Yeah, it? yeah, it is. Well, you've got seven hills there, so why not the seven yeah, well, kings? Huh? Yeah. Go ahead, Tim. Well, many people like to identify this great harlot with the Roman Catholic Church, but false religion is not limited to just one church. The inhabitants of the earth were made drunk. Religious Babylon intoxicated kings and peoples. Karl Marx was partly right when he said religion is the opiate of the masses. He was partly right because empty religion is the opium of the masses. Made drunk. The idea of fornication often has strong associations throughout the Bible with idolatry. Since this is a well-accepted religious system, it is likely to appear as an attractive and spiritual, though not necessarily moral. I, I, like, I like that verse too right there, if that's where you're at. Brother Paul was talking about a while ago, and as soon as I read that, that's what I thought about with that preacher where he was at. And they have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Yep. In other words, spouting that stuff from the pulpit yeah. is the wine of her fornication. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 
Exactly right. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So three through six, what that John's was awesome. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. What John saw. Yeah. So he carried away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abomination and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. John is carried away into the wilderness. The desolate nature of the wilderness is an appropriate setting for a vision of judgment. The harlot rides the same beast, the seven heads and ten horns, that was previously seen in Revelation 13.1, the Antichrist and his dictatorship. Her association with blasphemy and the dragon's beast are clear, clearly seen from God's perspective. But to the people of earth, she will look quite religious and have the faith that everybody wants. It's kind of like we were talking earlier, that you'll have the preachers in the pulpit and everybody, I, and I know I've been guilty of it myself, when you're sitting in that congregation, you expect that man that is sitting in that pulpit, that he is, he's all knowing, he's more religious than I, Right. And he is he is far more worthy than I am. Well, there it is, right there. Same smell. Yeah. What is the mystery? Do you do you think it into the mystery there? The you mystery. Down. Yeah. The Babylon. Yeah, we haven't got into that yet. Okay. The woman is clothed with emblems of luxury, purple, gold, and precious stones. And government, scarlet. Scarlet is, will represent governments. Can I back you up just a minute? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, uh, and y'all probably already know it, but the seven heads represent the empires, which we were talking about. And those are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. See, Rome's in there. Yep. That was from Daniel. That, that six of them, yeah. and the uh, seventh one is when it comes back. Rome is coming Rome back. Rome is coming back. Yeah, that's your six. That was the statue from and, Daniel. And the ten horns represent the ten nations that will arise out of the old Roman Empire. Right, the new territory. nations. New nations that will support that will the beast. That persecute Israel. Right, that will support the beast. And that's going to be out of the Roman Empire. And those Empire. ten kings, remember, you got to remember, how many kings is going to be at the Battle of Armageddon? Ten. Yep. One don't make it, or so it'll be nine. But that, that's in Revelation too. That, right. I just wanted to clear that up. Oh, no, you're good. Well, that's know. why I wanted to hear the names I, uh, without going back to Daniel. But I was glad Rome was one of them because Rome is there, but Rome is going to be the biggie coming back. Coming back. Right. Okay. So Rome is going to be those other six that we were mentioned, which is Muslim nations. Rome is going to be over all of them. Right. You see what I'm saying? And she's going to use all the, all the money and resources they've gathered. She's going to use that. So yeah. Rome, is, is Rome going to be the actual location? Is it going to be Rome? I, I, just, I, I don't think so. I, I can't. I, so I, why bring up the seven hills? I think that is the actual location. I have it in the seven hills. Do Rome itself. Is. No, well, no, Rome itself right now. Is located on Seven Hill. Okay. Yeah, that's why I'm a Jew. So, <laughs> so it also there's seven nations involved too, isn't it? Well, that, we just did we that. Just did she the just seven. read them to you. The, it was the sixth, and Rome is the seventh. Rome is one of the six. The so seven the hills one. could have meant nations too. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. guess why? You want to know why? You know why it is seven nations? Why? Because she's sitting on top of the seven nations. So that's what McGee told me anyway. Yeah, yeah. That, no, seven, it, well, it's seven, it says seven hills, doesn't it? Yeah. She's yeah, sitting yeah. on seven hills. 
Well, that's further down. Yes. Yeah. You'll get your chance again. The woman is clothed with emblems of luxury and government, yet she offers idolatry, abominations, and impurity, filthiness of her fornication. This is the setting. Purple and scarlet were colors of splendor and magnificence back then. The dyes to make these fabrics were very rare and costly. Now, also keep in mind, purple and scarlet were the colors of rulers. This goes into play with just what you were talking about. Whether they are economical rulers right. or political rulers. Right. Or religious rulers. Right. Now, the scarlet color also represents the persecution. Yeah, of the saints. Of, yeah. Now, uh, and of, yeah. on her forehead, a name was written. The name on her forehead identifies her in more ways than one. Well, before you say that, I want to say this. We need to keep ourselves attuned to the fact we're not talking literally here. Because when it says she was arrayed by all that, and she full of the abomination and filthiness of her fortification, that is the influence. That is what she's going to yeah, cause. It, it's we all have the, to remember the little whispering in your ears. Well, yeah. Rome, if you will, it is, here, 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 let's say this, Rome is a metaphor for what? Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. Yes, you got to keep that in your head, yeah. because otherwise you're going to get lost in geographics, you're going to get lost in systems, yeah. and all that. You have to keep that in your head, that those three is what this is about. It's all the religions. Yeah. And the allurement that they have. <coughs> well, and that's what I was fixing to yeah. say, like the Roman... The name being on her forehead. Roman prostitutes frequently wore a headband with their name engraved upon it. When, uh, was it Jacob? Jacob went to a harlot and had a daughter. She, the girl, adorned herself like a harlot, so David Jacob. It wasn't it. Jacob, it was, um, it was the other brother, Reuben, was it Reuben? I don't know. No, it won't, Jacob. It was the one that. Are you talking about the one that um, she didn't get the birthright or whatever right, exactly. and this yeah. brings and everything? Yeah, so I, I know so he, she went to him. Yeah. She went to him and had his baby so she could get part of the birth. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, Mystery Babylon the Great. The title is not for literal Babylon. Amen. There you go. But it's spiritual representation, which is the source of all ideology and spiritual adultery. Amen. Exactly. There you go. That's right. This that's harlot the mystery is. That's the mystery. This harlot must be larger than any one branch of a religious institution. She is the embodiment of Satan's own economical movement. The religion of the world system. Our world strong with the philosophy that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe is prepared for the harlot's seduction. That's right. We see the casual disregard for the truth crippling the churches today. Amen. That's right. <laughs> the woman not only persecutes, she also <coughs> reveals in her persecution of the godly as a drunk reveals in wine or revels in wine, excuse me. John was amazed because this wasn't pagan persecution, such as he knew in his day, but religious error and persecution. This is a pseudo-church. Say that again. I want to hear that again. Religious error. A religious error and persecution. E-R-R-O-R -R -R or E-R-E? Um, -R -E? Error. Okay. Why does it say that? This is a pseudo-church. <coughs> false religion. Spouting false Thirsty lies. Thirsty for blood of yeah, the saints. False lies to, to <coughs> grow up and cause people to follow them. Right. False yeah. religion is always the worst enemy of a true religion. I love that religious error. I've never seen those two can words I, put together. I, I love that. something there about this false religion? This weekend I met a woman. She talked about See, she doesn't want to know anything about Jesus Christ. She's got a God. 
Oh my. She says, oh God, I said, well, can you describe your God? Exactly. She says, well, I went, I went to a Baptist church for years. And uh, she says, I uh, went to a Baptist church for years and, and uh, I was baptized. I said, well, will you baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? She said, yeah. I said, well, that's your God. That's right. Good for that's you. That's it. But this is what I'm seeing. People want to deny Christ, but want to say there's a God. That's right. A supreme being. And I wonder if this is going to be the first step towards that false religion. Well, I love what you just said. That is called religious error. Yep. Yeah. That's religious error that she just said. Yeah. yeah. That's what that is. I'm going to teach you, Paul. I'm going to teach you, and I'm going to commit religious error. Yeah. I'm going to teach you that there's many, many paths to get to heaven. All you got to do is believe in God. I didn't say Jesus. Thank you, Oprah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, uh, Oprah yeah. and the Pope. Yeah. But there's many ways to get to heaven. So yeah. the, the priest, the Pope, yeah. said that. Well, there's I'm running paths. into it the first time this I ran into it. And uh, she ended up saying, well, when I pray, I feel God. I feel God inside. I said, well, you just keep on praying. Praying. Tears, she started crying. Tears. And she says, started telling me about some of her past history. And I said, well, I want you to just keep on praying That's and praying right. and praying. Right. So, I don't know. Maybe something will come out of that. Well, it, it, God is a great educator. Yeah. And through her prayers, he's going to give her an education. Yeah. Well, come. I felt sorry for her. Well, because because she was really confused and lost. There you go. Confused. Yeah. That's religious error right there. That's exactly what that is. Yeah. yeah. So, one thing I want us to remember is we should never forget that some of the most vicious persecution conducted against true Christians have been done in the name of the church. That's right. Yeah. So, I agree keep with that. that in mind. Well, who was the guy in England that was trying to write the Bible? Is it John you Rogers. Did you fix him to bring that out? Yep. Yeah. Um, in the days when the Roman Catholic oh, Queen Mary so. ruled England, she was known as Bloody Mary. Right. Some 288 Christians were burnt at the stake for their stand for the Christian truth between 1555 and 1558. Church of England. The yeah. first of these martyrs was a man named John Rogers, right. who as he stood chained to a stake, and the fire rose around him up to his legs and his shoulders. He rubbed his hands in the flames as if he were washing his hands in cold water. Then he lifted his hands to the heavens and held them high until he was completely consumed by fire. Rogers went to the stake with such acclaim and dignity that the French ambassador wrote that he went to his death as if he was walking to his wedding. Yeah, his cur courage was so evident that the huge crowd burst into applause when they saw him walk into the state. Mary and the Church of England did not want everyday people to have a copy of the Bible. Right. They wanted to control religion so strictly and only give them little bits here and there. Yep. You as a common person couldn't have a Bible. Well, this one individual... I'm going to write a Bible for the masses. Yeah. And they killed him. Yep. They killed him. Burned him at the stake. Burned him at the stake. Was he Methodist? I think he was Methodist. No, no you're thinking Luther, aren't you? No, no. no. Luther, Luther was Lutheran. Yeah, yeah. he was uh, yeah. Reformation. Yeah, absolutely. He was pro, well, like it's the beginning of Protestantism. Yeah. yeah. But the Church of England, real religion, once again, did that. Here it is, mo well, I can't say modern day. But after Jesus, yeah. well, religion killed Jesus. So, you know. And the other thing we got to the Church of England in America is Episcopal. Yes, yeah, so exactly right. And then after that is Presbyterian. That's right. I agree with you 100%. You know, yeah. That's what the Scott Irish were, yeah. Presbyterian. Yeah, my. And then most of them changed the Methodist. But what it boils down to is that the greatest persecution comes from the churches. This is that the right. Yeah. Okay. So. Verse 7, the angel tells John that the harlot will be explained to him. 
But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The focus of the explanation is on the beast. It appeared that the harlot ruled or rode the Antichrist system, but he is the dynamic factor. Using her as tyrants have always used religion as a mere tool to accomplish their purpose. So, kind of carry that with you. Verse 8. The, now here we go. Now this is the best verse. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to the perdition and those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and is yet yet is. I really don't have anything to put on that. That by itself is enough. Well, the beast that you saw that was yep. was one of the six, which is wrong. Yep. Went wrong. And now is not because it was destroyed. Right. What's going to rise? Rome is going to rise Rome yet again. going to rise even greater yep. as, than it was before. That's what it's talking about right there. Right? Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't I, I no, didn't feel is. like it needed anything. But see, and that's why, I, that's why when Mama read those names, that is so <coughs> important to what we're studying. Right. To reflect back on Nebuchadnezzar and his dream that Daniel uh, 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 interpreted for him to know those seven nations. Right. Those seven nations is so important to this part of the Bible. And then that's how we get our answers. And we now, remember that. Need to go back and read that. Now, yeah. Now, yeah. Read those nations again. Well, the nations I can read to you, that's Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. But go. what I was getting ready to say is what he says here, as far as the beast, you saw what it represents is a fallen angel who helped the leaders of these empires of the past in their efforts to destroy Israel. And, and who would the fallen angel be? Satan. And then it said the powerful fallen angel uh, the bottomless pit, he was there 2300 years ago and uh, it's talking about he was released to help the Antichrist. Which is. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, let's see, the, and when it says it going into perdition, means that after his escapade of helping the Antichrist on earth, go he will consign to the lake of fire. That's right. That's where he'll go. He come out of hell and he's going back. And, he's yeah. going and that's back. what verse said. And yeah. verse 8 being I.E. Rome. Right. And yeah. then, uh, let's see, when it says they dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names. And you know what I, I, I don't like about commentators like this? He, once again, is talking. He's just propagating more metaphors. Right. Break it down into everyday English so people can understand it. What you've done is taken metaphors and come up with new metaphors. Right. And that's what he's doing, and he shouldn't do that. Right. I get so ill at these people, you know, because they have the golden opportunity right. to teach people and teach it in their own language where they can understand it. But at least but he's, he's giving you something that the you go, can go by, but you still now, okay, what he's done, you've taken these metaphors, now he's taken his, now you got to dig even deeper. Right. right. That makes me so upset. All right, so let's move on to verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. That's an explanation right there. That's Many the quickly associate the seven mountains with Rome and the papyacy because Rome is well known as the city of seven hills. Yet literally the Greek word means mountains, not hills. Many commentators, especially those who see all of Revelation fulfilled in history, regard the seven mountains as an impure, irrefutable connection with Rome. Clark is a good example of this when he writes, this verse 
has been almost universally considered to allude to the seven hills upon which Rome originally stood. But the Bible, but in the Bible, mountains are sometimes a figure of government, such as in Daniel 2.35. Same smell. And the city of Rome is built on hills, not mountains. And the city of Rome oversees seven political, right. economic, and religious systems. Right. Muslims, Protestantism, Catholicism, right. Hindu, um, there's seven. There is seven. I can't remember one. So it is probably better to see the seven mountains as representing the seven kings and kingdoms described in Revelation 17.10. The statue again. Many people find the connection between religious Babylon and the Roman Catholicism irresistible. Yet it is flawed in the sense that there is no doubt that the religious Babylon will incorporate a strong Roman Catholic element, but it will be much bigger than Roman Catholicism. Right. Tendencies for Roman Catholicism ulti ultimate partnership with a one world religion were evident in Pope John Paul II's bizarre involvement with and approval of anti-Christian religions. In addressing a prayer gathering of Christians, Muslim, Jews, Buddhists, and others, Pope John Paul told participants that their efforts were unleashing profound spiritual energies in the world and bringing about a new climate of peace. The Pope pledged that the Catholic Church intends to share in and promote such an interreligious or interreligious corporation. What is that? One world religion. Yep. Yeah. The Catholic Review commented on this and said the unity of religion promoted by the Holy Father Pope John Paul and approved by His Holiness the Dalai Lama is not a goal to be achieved immediately. <laughs> but a wrong. day may come when the love and compassion yeah. which both Buddha and that Christ one that's one more I couldn't think of. preached so eloquently will unite the world in a common effort to save humanity from senseless destruction. Many roads to heaven. And lead toward the light in which we all believe. That's the statue. Yeah. Yeah. The names. So, yeah. Yeah, it tells you what each piece is. I'll be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they got them all in there, don't they? Yeah. Did, did, so I didn't know Oprah was the writing. <laughs> she was writing prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> so verse 10. There are also seven kings. Five, fallen, five have fallen. One is and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Again, we are referring to Rome. This is one more difficult passage in the book of Revelation. Some explain these seven kings, five past, one present, and one to come, succession of the Roman empires in John's era. But there are many historical difficulties with this approach. More likely it is to reference the five have fallen, Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, Medo-Persia, and Greece. One is refers to the world empire of John's day, Rome. The other that has not, not yet come refers to the one world empire Which is Rome. to come and re revival of the Roman Empire. Exactly. When he comes and he c must continue a short term, the seventh will be a quickly be taken over by an eighth and will become the state of the Antichrist. There are problems with this viewpoint as well. Some have taken the seven. That's in 11. Verse 11 says what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> but it's plainly a difficult passage. Right. So, verse 11, And the beast that was and, and is not is himself also the eighth, and is the seventh, and is going to perdition. He is of the seven in the sense that he shares characteristics with all previous world empires. 
but his fate is clear. Perdition means destruction, and the beast will be destroyed. 12 through 15. I love this part right now. The ten horns which you see are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority from one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them. I'm talking about Armageddon. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. This probably alludes to the Ten Nation Confederation. But some take the ten as a symbolic number. Many have seen the European Union, formerly the European Economic Community, as the potential fulfillment of this. Perhaps, but now, there are more than ten nations in this revived European power, and more on the way. <coughs> There is little doubt that the EU, EU itself claims to be the successor of the ancient Roman Empire. <coughs> when six European nations meet to talk about combining their nuclear, coal, and economic resources, they met together in Rome and signed a treaty in Rome, the beginnings of the present EU. In many places in Europe, the EU flag is just as prominent as a national flag. <coughs> we could still say what Alfred wrote in 1866 is the precise number and form where he indicated that they have not yet arisen. What changes in Europe may bring them into the required tale and form, it is not for us to say, but it will happen and this confederation of nations will emerge as an heir to the ancient Roman Empire. There is one mind. Whatever their exact identity, their actions are clear. They join with the Antichrist with the war against Christ in the battle to allude to the sixth and seventh foes. The harlot presides over peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. This tells us that the harlot's influence is worldwide through her connection to the beast. This will be a truly one world religion. Right. The interpretation of the harlot focuses on her relation to the beast. She is utterly connected to the beast and his government. Which beast is it? Now which, yeah, that's it. Is this the beast of the sea or the beast of the earth? Satan. Yeah. Satan. It's Satan. That's the dragon. That's the dragon. Yeah, Satan. That's Satan himself. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. not. Yeah. All right. Now, so if it's confusing. Well, see, and that's what I'm saying. That's why we need to date and make sure, just like I got upset about this man here using metaphors once again, we're talking beast, beast, beast. Which beast is it? It needs to be brought out what beast we're talking about. That way you could get a better understanding. And I see, agree with you. I was with the theory that this is the beast of the sea. This is the Antichrist. And he wants rid of her because he wants to be worshipped. You know? Well, we get into that. Actually, actually, well, actually, the beast is the final world kingdom ruled by the Antichrist. Now, remember what I said before? When you, you, the beast can be a conglomeration of beliefs or a, 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 a political, economic, or, or religious. But I got the feel, and I, I, I may be wrong, Go ahead. but I thought the beast, the Antichrist, is an individual. That's right. Well, no, I don't a, know. A man, a woman, or it, some type you, of you, you, you probably got, you're right, you probably got a figure that represents the power of the kingdoms. Okay? The beast, the final world kingdom, ruled by the Antichrist. You see what I'm saying? You can have one man over all of them. He is a figurehead of everything. Yeah. Okay. I agree with that. I don't, okay. Yeah. But, so I just when the Antichrist I, comes, I, I, I said, let, let me look this up. Okay. The dragon 
is Satan, mm -hmm. the beast of the sea, the beast of, you know? All right. And, and then, whoa, what pops up? Some harlot from Babylon. <laughs> <laughs> you would complicate it even more. Well, you got, that's why I'm saying we have to be careful. And that's why I like asking who this beast is. The beast itself, the harlot in Babylon, is a world, worldwide government of uh, religious, economic, and political. That is the horror of Babylon. Now, picture um, sitting on the top of the world is this collective, and you got all these vines or pipes coming up from all the rest of the world, and everything's coming to that one certain thing. That is the whole of Babylon. That is your money, your goods, your people, your thought. Everything is going flowing to this person. And, and it's in the making right now. That's okay. exactly right. That's what we were saying. Go ahead, Dan. All right, so verse 16, and the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot make her desolate and naked, and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. This violence probably takes place at the midpoint of tribulation period. Her apostate religion discovers the true nature of the beast. Ultimately, the Antichrist will not tolerate any worship except of himself. And we see that in Second Theologians. The son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Burn her with fire. Once his power has been consolidated, the Antichrist no longer needs the help of the religious Babylon. He will then work to dismantle and destroy her, and her one world religion. This has always been the goal of tyrants. And most politicians, they use religion for their purpose, then they discard it. Can I have a second here? Desolate, he separates her, exposes her naked, mm -hmm. then eats her flesh, takes her wealth, right. and then just Oh, it destroys the remains. Yep. Right. This is a nasty dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. It's going to do right. it all. That's right. So verse 17, For God has put into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be one of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. God directed the judgment against religious Babylon. God will sometimes use a wicked group here, the ten kings, to be an instrument of his judgment against another wicked group. Here, the religious Babylon. And I've said it a thousand times. God will use evil to accomplish his will. That's, That's right. Good, okay. And there's a lot of people, well, I just don't believe God would do that. Well, yes. just, just all he's going to do is read the history of the Jews. <laughs> that, I, just don't, I just don't think God could do that. <laughs> so to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beasts, God will ordain the political support of these ten kings for the Antichrist. God will give the world just what it wants. Godless religion and godless rulers. Thank you. And it Thank sounds you. a lot like our upcoming election. It does. Kamala Harris is what Mama said. Yeah. When she thought she said Kamala in my mind was America. Mm -hmm. Our country itself is the whore of Babylon. Yep. What country in the world uses the most of the world's resources? Yep. Okay. What country in the world influences other governments politically? Yep. What one country uses majority of the food of the planet? Yep. One country. And, and America, the way, way I broke it down is all these. Everybody is falling over themselves over Kamala Harris. Harris. Oh, right. right. And well, they she gonna, is a false she, prophet. She's right? going to be, they're going to they going to use her up and then they're going to destroy her. And then once they destroy her, we're going to, the United States is going to be in a very bad way and all these other countries We're are going to destroy, destroy us. That's where I'm at with it. That's the way so I, I When I read this, I thought about America. Yeah. 
Yeah, I did too. I know we're going to be just, I know we're on the way out. That's right. I don't know who's going to do it. I don't know if she's going to do it. I don't know if Trump's going to do it. I don't think it's Trump. But anyway, I know we're on the way out. I agree with you. And it, it's going to happen. It's it's so long. That's where he was talking about we're in pre-tribulation. We're in pre-trib right we now. We've got enough nuclear bombs to make islands disappear. That's right. But it's not going to be that and way. We've got no. enough to block the sun out. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then we've got this global thing that we're right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I don't, like I said, God's in control. That's right. So verse 18. We just need to pray that we're See, worthy. I don't think, I think about this. I don't think God creates it, the evil. I think he just allows it. He uses it. He, he does it. He, he don't it. create it. He uses well, it. Well, it says right there, God have put in their hearts. He put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. Yeah. God yeah. says, he says, yes, he did. And so he, yes, he did. I put it in their hearts. What did it do to Pharaoh? Yeah, yeah. He he hardened yeah. Pharaoh's heart to fulfill his will. Yeah, that's right. To teach a lesson. Yeah. So yeah, he he uses evil. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. So, and, and we've been getting that all through here. Yeah. 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 All right. Then. Verse eighteen. And the woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Bad enough. In John's day, there was no doubt which city reigns over the kings of the earth. Rome was the political, economic, and religious center of the world of that time. And it's coming back. In this sense of the world system has always been that great city which reigns the kings of the earth. The question, it, question for Christians is, does it reign over me, or am I the citizen of a better city, the Jerusalem above? That great city... Again, the association of this harlot of religious Babylon with Rome doesn't mean that the Roman Catholic Church is the identical to religious Babylon, though apostate Rome Catholics will definitely be part of this great harlot. The great city, rather Rome, was the ready personification of Babylon, the world in rebellion against God in John's day. Today, idolatry is just as strong, but more dispersed. Today, which city in the world is most readily identified with the world system? Hollywood, Wall Street, Washington, Rome? All the above. All the above. Well, let me read you this. Towards the end of the tribulation period, however, the ten kings will destroy will destroy the harlot right. system. You hear what I said? Mm -hmm. Harlot system. That is what we just said. The Rome, Rome being the center of it. And the ten kings, you know, the picture this. I kind of thought the king, the ten kings, at the beginning of this was just kind of like hovering around. They're participating in the tribulation. They're participating in the persecution. They're participating and supporting the harlot. It didn't say that. We didn't read that anywhere. It says they're going to destroy the, the system itself because God put it in their, their heart to do that. Right. But in the meantime, they were serving Satan and the Antichrist up to that point. Now think about that because look at what Pharaoh did. Here we go. The Bible's repeating itself. Pharaoh enslaved the Israelites to do his will. Build whatever enslaved them. Okay. Well, at the same time, we got ten kings right here. That's part of the Antichrist. And God puts it in their heart to do what? To serve him. That's right. To destroy that system. And once that system is destroyed, what's coming? Jesus. That's right. Jesus. That's what we got to remember. That's right. Jesus is coming. And so now, next week. So, so, once that system is destroyed, will, how long will the Antichrist reign? He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming for his thousand years. Okay. Okay. Now in eighteen, we're fixing to learn more about the destruction. Okay. You know, eighteen is going to be. This that's, is part two. That's that's when we'll be yeah. the end of these people. Yeah. Uh, Seventeen. 
we're preparing and letting you know what's going to happen. 18, we're going to give you the details. Okay. Yeah. It's been wonderful. It's been really good. Yeah. Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving us another day. We thank you for your love, Lord God, and we thank you for our daily bread, that portion that you have signed to each one, Lord God. More than just a blessing, Lord, but it's everything we need to live our lives, Lord, for you. We thank you again, Lord, for your word that we can study and learn. We thank you for giving us a pure heart and pure mind. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that comes amongst us, Lord God, to help teach and educate us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for all these blessings. We ask you, Lord, now to bless all that are here and their families, Lord God, and keep them safe and strong till we can meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.